join us for all of them. With no further ado, I leave it to the two people who should be talking for the rest of the hour and 15 minutes. Hetal, Judith, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Jehan. Welcome, Judith, once again to this lovely space. Um, okay, so I'm going to immediately dive right in. I am very curious in understanding your individual practice as well as your practice in an institution that's Lambda. How are you kind of exploring and navigating through the, like, like for me presented, that how are we working with aspects of touch and breath and frequencies and sound and all of those things because everything is now digital. Um, yes, I understand this whole aspect of understanding the technology to facilitate us better, but that apart, as a practitioner, how are you adapting to these um, changed sound qualities, changed blips and freezes, and also the kind of um, the quality of sound, which changes totally. So it, that's the right, the first introduction that we have to our students and with our students. And we take that and then we kind of blossom into something else. But how, are, how is your starting point individually as a practitioner when you're working with your students in terms of these aspects, sound, breath, frequency, blips, and all those things? Yeah. So shall I shall I go off on my prepared talk, Hazel? Shall I shall I go because that, um, that sets me straight in actually. Absolutely. So I I am aware that you have like a, a very very um, inclusive plethora of things that you would like to share, and that would be amazing. Where we kind of touch upon everything that's going on, every possibilities that have perhaps cropped into your head, and you've explored or tried and explored in that sense. So I leave it up to you, and um, maybe then I can kind of bombard my my questions and we yes. can eventually open it out to the whole room and yes. we'll we'll just make it an open house eventually all right over that'd to be you. brilliant thank you so yeah. much and I, I wanted to start by saying how thrilled i am to be here in uh with you all and and to see all these faces and people from all over the world and um hugely look forward to hearing different people's experiences so that I can learn from them. So I'm going to start off, um, Hadel has been very good about drilling me down to a question, the, the, the question that's that's gone through all the um, debates so far, which is how do we teach in the absence of presence, um, which I think is such a useful, precise question to ask. And what I've done is I have written some notes down because I was worried I'd start veering off into um, various things and then probably burst into tears. So I've, I'm, I've kind of kept myself on track i hope um, and i divided that question into four areas the first the first area is the practical so i just want to let you know the experience that i've had and and feed in some of the experience that my colleagues have had uh having to move online so rapidly um, the second question is rather grandly entitled in my notes the art um, the third question i touch briefly on a political question that i that somebody raised a couple of talks ago from Australia and I, I want to ask and I want to find out what people think about that particularly. And then the fourth section is the future. So some idea of you know, where are we going to go even though obviously none of us know. Um, so in terms of the practical, Lambda closed on the 16th of March. Um, at that stage, our foundation course was coming to the end of its second semester. It's just a two semester course. So that was about to finish. So that continued for a couple of weeks on Zoom very rapidly. They had to shift onto Zoom and they managed to complete their course in that way. I'll be honest with you, I don't have detail about that because I wasn't involved in that particular um, course. Uh, and all our other courses at that point were suspended. And we agreed that we'd start teaching online on April the 28th. So we had an extremely intense time, as you can imagine, shifting every single discipline that was movement, voice, acting, workshop productions, rehearsals, one-to-one -one singing on, onto an online uh, forum. Um, we had a lot of discussion about what might work. We had a lot of discussion and a lot of practice and a lot of panic around the different platforms and the technologies because I'll be honest with you, I think I can safely say all of us had either very, very little experience of teaching online or absolutely none. Um, 
what we did was split our cohorts into what we call clusters of around about five students. There was some teaching in larger groups, uh, 30 and 15, and some of the rehearsals involved larger groups. But for the most part, the teaching was in small groups or one-to-one. -one. Um, as it turns out, of course, that's very expensive, but that's a whole other thing. Um, we also had many time zones to, to, to embrace. So we had a student in Australia, we had a student in Newfoundland, we had a student in New Mexico, students all over the US, students in Canada, students all over Europe. Um, so you can imagine that the kind of practicality of it was an absolute nightmare to try and, try and sort it all out. Um, most of the sessions lasted one hour because we thought that would be enough online. Um, and we also had one-to-one -one sessions that Jeremy, who's with us today, was particularly involved in that, that, that lasted 20 minutes um, and that would be practical voice, rehearsal support and so on. In the meantime, I filmed myself doing a warm up with the help of my beloved, who's here, Jem, <laughs> who manned the camera as I, uh, you know, filmed myself gyrating around the room and sent that out to um, all the students to keep them ticking over and I recorded uh, auditory exercises so that they could work in semi-supine or they could work on, on text exercises as well and got those out to them. So the work starts on April the 28th and we learn very, very rapidly. Um, I found out it's much more possible to work live and on my feet than I thought it was. Um, I also found, slightly contradicting myself now, but I devised, kind of as I went along, a seated warm-up with the students, which was quite short. Um, but even if I was trying to get people up on their feet a lot, um, sometimes they were doing, we were all doing a lot more sitting than we were accustomed to. Um, so I realised that if we closed our eyes and we covered them with our hands, we could have a kind of soothing sort of velvety darkness away from the screen, focus on space in the pharynx, space for the breath. Um, think about the bottom as the equivalent of the feet in the chair, think about lower abdominal muscles, thinking about the sacrum. So really tuning into the, the body um, in a seated position and keeping the sense of the physical alive. Um, my area, so, so, so I realised through that really, I began to realise, I think I like to think quite quickly that proprioception, which I took to Hitler a lot about, proprioception is so vital, just keeping the sense of, of, of this of how things feel, vibrations alive when you're on your own quite a lot of the time and frightened. Um, the area I teach predominantly is applied voice. I sort of teach across uh, most things, but I, I, I specialize, it sounds grand, but that's my specialism. Um, I work with voice and language um, and the link between them. So I, I work, so I, I, I did a lot of work around text online. I did practical warm ups, um, getting text up on its feet trying to find exercises that helped each individual student un unleash the text um, to help them release to explore it um, and then later in the term I encouraged them to start to lead warm-ups as well so they'd come up with exercises and um, and and support each other um, there's an exercise that I've been teaching before that involves linking imagination body breath and sound into text um, exploring the self and the voice and, and the character. And interestingly, that exercise requires the actor to work in boxes uh, laid out on the, the uh, squares, if you like, laid out on the floor. So it was peculiarly kind of um, apposite to have these boxes on the floor and then the boxes on the screen. There was a kind of dimensional thing um, going on. Um, my colleagues, meanwhile, were doing a lot of accent and speech work, which I think works very well and fairly straightforwardly in this in this medium. A lot of one to one work. Um, I noticed some students, there's some nice unplanned outcomes, if you like, that some students who are quite quiet in class and, and are worried about feeding back really found their online presence and found a voice. They, they, they sort of felt safer in a way to contribute more to the class. So that was a lovely thing to, to discover and find out about people's online personalities. The buts with the work, well, the work, works, the work works rather well in many ways, to be honest. Students are responsive. I'm learning loads of new things. Um, but of course, there's the sense that underpins everything that we're now living in this kind of nightmarish parallel universe. And I found that these beautiful, this is where I start to get a little bit tearful, I'm sorry, but these beautiful um, gifted young actors that I've, I've got to know are confined, they're confined, they're stuck and they're really frightened. So 
I felt that a lot of my work was a very strong duty of care towards them to hold them and to encourage them, you know, and keep them positive without being ridiculously unrealistic about everything. So that was that was a big thing. Um, in voice, there was also a huge frustration around the sound quality of the different connections. It's exhausting trying to hear the resonance of someone's voice um, through the white noise and the blips and the freezes. You know, um, I had my first Zoom dream roundabout now where I was trapped in a lit up box. Um, I also, I really need to see people's feet. I start, all my work starts from the feet upwards. And um, I, I work a lot with the downward connection into the earth, the downward trajectory, and then the upward energy of the spine um, through the crown of the head, like all of us. And, and, and um, th this was very, very hard uh, to do. The work's physical, it's hand on, it's shared, it's about shared space, it's about shared breath. It's about the thrill of working with excitable air. And none of that really, in all honesty, could we have. Um, students were frustrated with the pressure of having to be continually creative online, come up with new ideas all the time, constant self-taping. Uh, and all they wanted was to be together. You know, some of them are 18 years old. Um, some students were unable, and I think this is a really important point that we've touched on in previous discussions, but they were unable to work easily in their home settings. Um, so politically it's a it, it's that's really difficult it's not shared it's not equal we're not equal um we were able to support a lot of students we were lucky we had a fund with extra technology if they didn't have it available to them but you know if somebody can hear if you're sharing a room if you're having to work in your bedroom in a tiny space very very difficult and i think nothing replaces the equity of a shared space my response to all this oh gosh you know say keep your muscles working to the students respect your craft be kind to yourself, switch off the camera if you need to. There will be a future, it will be exciting. Do what you can, when you can, keep talking and try to structure your spare time so that you're using it well for yourself. So this, this, that, that's the longest section I'm gonna talk. This is about the art now. Um, I've spent all my teaching career encouraging students to tune into their senses to encourage an imaginative and a visceral engagement with language and communication. Students over the years, like all of us, I think, have become increasingly visual. So waking up the idea of smell and taste and touch and how these are pertinent to breathing life into text and encouraging also the slow, careful listening in a world where the average time spent online is around about 10 seconds uh, as you're browsing. Um, so this to me has seemed crucial to, to stay in touch with the senses. So this situation has felt um, at one level more than heartbreaking, um, but it has encouraged me to encourage them to stay in touch literally with the world around them um, and to continue to relate this to their imaginative exploration of text. I'm also amazed, I've been and have been and continue to be amazed by the beauty of some of the work I'm seeing students really finding how their character breathes, how the exploration and location of breath through full physical embodiment is thrilling. They can also sometimes hear their own sound more easily than in a class where we've got very echoey spaces in our new rooms at Lambda and they can actually hear their own sound more easily, which can be a, a bonus. Um, they did really brilliant things. They became really clever very quickly, exiting, you know, re renaming themselves as their character in their box, exiting by turning off their, their camera, um, using their, their whole space creatively, finding garments that help them find the character, learning how to do quick fire exchange on Zoom, all sorts of things. But again, it's very difficult to feel expansive, warm and generous if you don't know where you're sending your voice and what it's for, and this can be very painful. So the lens or of the laptop or the phone me means you have a constantly split focus, which I've obviously got now, um, and this is hard vocally. Um, so we tried, you know, working towards the lens and pinning somebody just underneath so you know you're there. We tried coming out and opening out into the space, um, uh, sort of exploring the parameters of the space that we were in. Um, the thrill of shared vibrations feels to me like it's pinned like a butterfly in this glowing frame at the moment. Um, the here and now of the voice can be explored through proprioception, but really the intention to speak has to involve communication and release of those vibrations. Um, 
this becomes really difficult when you're not in the same room and when you know that the technology is unreliable it's easier to focus i suppose on, on range and articulation which we did quite a lot of work on um, the politics uh, this is section three. Um, I've only got one thought here. I've got one question and it's not a very formed question, but I thought I'd throw it out there. I ask, is it convenient in the face of market forces, particularly now, for the promulgation of the educational theory that places the teacher on the sideline as a witness to the student-led experience of finding out for themselves, often online? How does this sit with practical training such as training a voice where self-discovery needs to be held and guided especially in the establishment of the basic technique would you let a beginner loose with a chainsaw in a woodwork class especially if they were working on their own uh, last section briefly the future oh, i was very heartened to find that students who prepared work online and then were able to return to the live space because we are back in the live space at lambda adapted really quickly from one realm to the other vocally. They enjoyed being allowed to take the space again. Um, and this may bode well, I hope, for blended learning. Um, we also managed to blend live and distanced work. So there was one point when I was coaching a rehearsal and I couldn't be there. So I apparently, I didn't realize at first that I was, I was on a giant TV screen in the rehearsal room. Um, so the students were in the rehearsal room, I was on the screen and that worked, that actually worked rather well, I enjoyed that. Um, in the live performances that we've done some actors needed to stay on screen so uh, you'd have a scene like and then they'd, they'd pop up on on zoom um the, the technology let us down a bit but it was very interesting and they developed great things like you know passing a letter so i pass a letter to the screen and then the person on the screen picks up the letter it's just you know lovely little ideas creative ideas like that um, I think the two metre distance on stage was interesting. I thought that actors needed to extend to each other a little bit more, which was quite useful because of being aware of that. So they were taking the stage space as well as the, the theatrical space. Um, I'm excited by the idea of outdoor and site specific work. Uh, it's great for voice, it's great for those muscles. So we'll see how that goes. Also great for exploring different acoustics. Um, and in terms of training, I remain concerned about instilling the work which i was saying earlier with a new cohort um, it's okay to some extent if we can have blended learning although live work may be limited in terms of how much projection is viable because of spraying in space um, the lambda students at this stage had 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 a minimum of two terms training all of them some of them more and so they were in a good place to keep it ticking over when we went into lockdown um, so I wonder what it's like starting. I'll be really interesting, interested to hear how that goes at DSM. And the last thing I have to say just in this bit is I feel I have to remain optimistic for those young people and for art, you know, that the art, that the need for shared space, that exciting the live air to send great words out into someone else's ear won't go away. Uh, and I think we'll find a way through. So, so that's my... <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, thank you, Judith. That was extremely insightful. The one thing that really popped uh, was when you spoke of the distancing bit, the two meter distancing bit. Yeah. And I, my thoughts jumped to this, uh, to the section of vulnerability. We work with so much of finding safe space to be vulnerable, vocally, physically, with your breath, with your responses, and with your body to respond to certain emotions. How, it, which, which anyway is such a hard thing it's not easy to become vulnerable to yourself let alone to your co-actors or participants how are we navigating how are we making an effort to navigate that when there is longer distance now is that somewhere distancing the individual from the individual as well because now the struggle has changed it's there is an added struggle to this so i am wondering what are your thoughts on this distance and vulnerability what's what's happening to the relationship of that between the students and with with one own self and yeah. i'm quite curious to know that i think that's brilliant and i'm sure other people will have things to to say about that there's um working in the room if i'm doing a very intense text like um what any intense text really i've got an exercise where we uh, i won't go into it in too much detail now but we start we it, it, basically they start holding each other and then they very slowly 
expand space. Um, and that's obviously to, to tune into what you're saying about finding that vulnerability and the closeness mm. to somebody else and then being able to stretch that thing that actors can do where you've got magic air stretched across the space between you. Um, and to say that you can be as intense across the room as you can be close. Yeah. Of course, they're starting that far apart. Mm. But, but I, I think they have enough emotional memory, they have enough physical memory of what it's like to be close to someone to, mm. to use... Uh, vibrations to use contact with with their fellow actor to navigate that space mm. I think but again there'd be a question in my mind about how do you start working like how do you start yeah. the very beginnings of work like that um, mm. so I wonder if the proprioceptive work or the the work on the self and the sharing ideas around that in this manner could 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 it'll never replace that but it might mm. at least open it up to discussion but i think it's a great question yeah mm -hmm. okay all right all right there was there was one bit that um you mentioned and i believe even i had a setting of 20 minute one-on-ones happening in one of my uh, in some of my schedule uh, while i was at central i do find it very very useful but i'm wondering that's that's because that setting came in much uh, at, at a spot where we were we were somewhat sensitized to the work. But if we speak for new students, new incoming bunch who have absolutely no experience of working in a drama school, how much would we kind of expect out of the 20 minute one on one interaction? And what are our kind of goals, which I think Jeremy, uh, you, you said that Jeremy uh, conducts yeah. that and Jehan pointed that out as well. So yeah. I am myself very curious in knowing how are we seeing the setting of 20 minuteers with the new bunch? Yeah. I mean, what, what are what are the questions you guys are asking for yourself right now? Yeah, uh, again, I think that's a great question. And I, I'm about to start well, next month, start that experience as, as you will be about how do you start working with somebody? Mm -hmm. um, I would, pr my guess, and I want to ask Jeremy what his experience was, if that's okay, but but my, my instinct would be the word slowly would come in. Mm -hmm. So I think, <laughs> you know, I think a lot of finding, finding your spine, I mean, finding your spine, finding your feet, finding your body takes so long in the work anyway mm. and then factoring in release breath um obviously being able to allow the air in um in an easy way without working the air coming in i think i'd do a lot mm. of work around that but you'd, i think the advantage of the one-to-one -one situation is of course you're looking at the very specific need and, and mm. specific tensions of each student but like i say for us i mean it <clears throat> it's really expensive mm to work like that and for institutions who are struggling financially for obvious reasons at right. the moment yeah. i've i've got a feeling that the i don't know this and i mustn't speak out of turn about the lambda timetabling but i think the idea of smaller group and one-to-one -one work will be much more mm. restricted mm. we had to throw a lot of money at that online training just to be mm. practical for, for for a moment about it um mm -hmm. but yeah 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 jeremy what i, did I you find think? it sorry no yeah. No, no, I was just going to say to Jeremy if he had anything on those 20 minute <clears throat> I, I, I agree every, with everything Judith said about the specificity of having that kind of one on one connection. Mm -hmm. um, actually, with the F course, it was going to start being 20 minutes, so our foundation course, it ended up being half an hour. And actually, that extra 10 minutes with a younger student really gave right. a little yeah. bit more contact and room and focus. So the kind of five minutes either side allowed the 20 minutes in the middle to be quite uh, useful. But again, that probably, there's probably discussions above my pay grade that were to do with, uh, you know, money and finances. Mm -hmm. Also, the F course, it was at the end of their, it was at the end of their yeah. course. So I'd had a lesson with them every week for nine months in group where I'd been in the room with them, throwing balls, touching them, oh. feeling them ribs and stuff so we had a lot of material to, to refer back to yeah it's the shared language isn't it that you've, yeah, you've yeah. already established a shared language mm -hmm. um physically and in words <clears throat> with those students um and that like i keep saying that'll be really interesting to discover as we go through mm. and unpeel next term i mean at the moment we're planning blend, blended learning mm -hmm. and assuming there'll be a lot on site but we we all know we might have to come back to to this yeah 
so if I can unpick on this, uh, you said it's a blended learning for the new bunch that's going to come. Uh, yeah. What is the percentage? What is the balance? You, what are you teaching in the room and what are you teaching online? If you can just shed some light on that. Yes, of course. I think it varies from institution to institution. Yeah. Um, what Lambda is proposing at the moment, and it is still, so you know, it is still uh, not quite nailed down, is that each year group will have one day where they're online. <clears throat> and that Vic step in if I'm talking out of turn here, will you? Um, but uh, so that would mean that the um, the space is easier to manage on site. Mm. Um, and then some of the work would be one to one, but probably not as much as we've been doing. Like I've said, some of it would be the students preparing, journaling and doing work um, uh, at home. But I would imagine we'd have warm ups and so on and some rehearsal support will continue mm. online. So that's the proposal mm. at the moment. One day a week. Yeah. Uh, lovely. Is that right, Vic? I uh, broadly, yes, I think that is okay. right. It's about 20%, I think. Uh, okay. But I have a rather funny uh, observation and I want to see what you think about it. So when I work one-on-one, -on -one, and that's, that, that, that is considerable time of what I'm doing these days, I am not working with groups at all. So I really don't know how I will feel when I set myself in a group setting. But I am working a lot with one-on-one. -on -one. And I find it rather funny to, I understand there is a particular challenge in terms of accessing the sound, because the moment you bring them to an M, uh, a full or M sound, a MERS sound, it just breaks in the first millisecond and then there is no sound at all. It's, it's rather funny. But I find it even challenging to assess their physicality sometimes. One, because they might not have enough space for me to have that perspective. Uh, and I don't even mean that I want to be able to see them fully, even if I don't. Sometimes it's it's literally like they, they just don't know. And, you know, it's just always here and we're learning here. And we do tend to tell them how to tackle things like this. But sometimes it's like really, really, they're always here. Then at such a point, I feel it becomes all about how to handle technology rather than teaching voice. <laughs> So I yeah. am not sure how are you how are you navigating once a person knows where it is. It is still kind of morphed. The physicality is still kind of morphed. It's not really a real time figure that I see. I don't know. And then I I question myself that if I want that person to get into a particular posture and alignment, what is my reference point? Is the reference point even true enough? So, I mean, I don't yeah. know, what, what are your observations when you kind of work with people and see those yeah. shapes and figures? I recognise all those things. Um, I think Jeremy's thing about the hot, ex extending for one-to-ones from 20 minutes to half an hour, actually part mm -hmm. of that is establishing <laughs> that dealing with the technology. Also, I think emotionally seeing how that person is in, in today, because a lot of it, mm. a lot of us have described and you imagine being 18, going up and down emotionally so I think that has to be without without necessarily spending ages on it but it has to be acknowledged um in the mm. transaction I think because of obviously the effect on body and breath and tension mm. um so I think the longer adding that bit of time is really really crucial and also you have this curious thing where you let them go at the end and I used to have to I still hate pressing end meeting Oh, yeah. And they just, you know, you don't have any of the kind of just the, the thing of, of, of somebody disappearing just slowly into the distance in the space or going up the corridor or seeing them later. It's very curious, all that. In terms of the practical thing with body, I mean, I, I'm sure other people will have um, ideas around this. <laughs> to be honest with you, I do what, what I can and what, what I can see and try to work around the space that they have available. You know, some people literally work in their bedroom with a little t tiny space like this mm. um sometimes they, they 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 i think almost everybody had enough floor space to be able to get into semi-supine mm. and that was quite useful to get people down mm. on the floor and then hear how they're responding and suggest give them their direction they'd all had some alexander training mm. as mm. well so and we share a lot of the terminology we, we we use a lot of yoga and alexander in our voice work so we can share terminology that way um, 
yeah and and in terms of the the sound the resonance like i said it when i was talking earlier it's it, i i can only say it's really frustrating i used headphones quite a lot to try and in the aspiration of getting a more accurate yeah. idea about how they were sounding but it would depend hugely on the quality of the microphone and the quality of the connection mm -hmm. um but the, the one heartening thing was when they did get back in the space they 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 did move towards they did fill that space really well actually in the in the couple of shows that i went to see so that that was good um yeah i don't know if yeah. i've really answered your question but no that's 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 good enough as yeah sean i saw you raise your hand yeah go yeah yeah so, yes yeah. i don't know if now is an appropriate time just to ask a question there's so much judith thank you so much um just one of many, many points, but very quickly, um, I'm very interested in this idea you were saying of a word which I haven't heard before. Is it pro pre pre reception? Pre reception. Yeah, yeah, that's that's key for me. Um, but just going into the beginners, the the idea of working with beginners. A big question that I have in my mind is when you're in the room with them and you're starting them off on the voice and the body work. Um, they they can look at everyone. They can look at you. So I'm I'm thinking, where is their touchstone? If they're if they're at home, and this is something that might be new to them, might be entirely new to them. Who knows? Um, how can we facilitate their ability to sort of monitor what they're doing in the sense that they might they might want to know, is it right what I'm doing? Yeah. You know. So this 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 idea of um, the experience of it, the process of it being key. Yeah. Um, and the breath being really key, but 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 they, beginners. I'm my concern is that they're going to need something to sort of hold on to, something yeah. to say. Well, what what is my experience compared to other experiences? And it and that's yeah. a valuable question for them. Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I I think it does. It, it it sort of makes me think. Well, I think one thing that would really help would be for us to have time to have sufficient uh, preparation and technology to film really effectively how something looks i mean it's not you know sometimes we're demonstrating obviously visually but there is quite a lot of hands-on work which we can't have but at least having that as a starting point so somebody in profile you know profile of, in terms of length of spine and um, length of back of neck and then perhaps developing which i think we'll all be finding out won't we developing the language of proprioception so how do i describe how i think i mean we we, we, we use imagery all the time you know yeah. so we're blending anatomy as i know you know from your work but you're blending an anatomical knowledge yeah. detailed anatomical knowledge yeah. with what image will work to help that student find their spine and yeah, so i, I throw loads of different images at them yeah. um and say this may not work for you you know this is an idea this is something that i find helps and then hearing from them what they're finding helps them sense their spine so I think we I think we will develop that with beginners as we go along, and that's where I really want to know how Hatel gets on and, and Jihan gets on when, when you've got your beginners coming coming in or anybody else. It would be fascinating to sh keep sharing these conversations about new mm. ideas, mm. definitely because we were like Jeremy said about the foundation course. We're relying on a shared vocabulary that we've established in a completely different setting. We've established a three dimensional, if you like, vocabulary. Mm. Okay. Um, I see Ira, Jehan, and Tom has questions. So Ira, maybe maybe you can unmute yourself and shoot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Ira. I head the research and practice stand at Drama School. Um, and one of the things we've been struck, sorry, it's raining really heavily, so there's a bit of disturbance. Uh, one of the things we've been struggling with has been. Um, working on collaborative creation with students. So because it's not only an acting school, uh, it's not only a performance school, it's all, they're also making work, they're writing, they're devising, they're creating their own pieces. Uh, the big challenge seems to be that a lot of work that can happen online seems to be solo work. Uh, most of the workshops that one has come across, most of the things that teachers have spoken about has been oriented towards individual work people working on their own bodies, their own voices, figuring out their own space, um, you know, to be inventive and create work. But how does one get students who have no experience of physical space before, who have never been in the theater, they're just starting out, 
how does one sort of get two or three people in separate places to create something together uh, mm -hmm. and not i don't mean in terms of dividing work and responsibilities as in one person writes one person performs one that's still that's still individual work how does how do they sort of respond to each other how do they help each other how do they play off of each other um i i know that we're not in a place to have all these great answers yet but has anybody had any experience with this sort of work or any ideas about how one might go about doing this i'll say briefly but because it's sort of that's going into areas that i know other people will have done more acting teachers and and um uh more than possibly than voice teachers a couple of things one is that um lambda set up a, what they call a scratch night so the students could come and bring songs poems things that they developed um and i think people were working together they made amazing films together uh that 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 i was able to watch so there i mean it's me I'm, I'm obviously ancient but their their kind of awareness of how to use the technology is quite extraordinary and they were doing some very very clever stuff but i can't tell you how on earth they were doing it to be honest and i really need to sort that out and the, the one thing that does worry me is that the things you know when you see those those choirs on zoom it's impossible to have you, you can't do that vocally you cannot sing to you, you can pre-record and, and edit and do all those things and hear other people i think i'm right in saying but to have choric work on zoom simultaneously and live is is um i think impossible what happens is you just get <laughs> these little squeaks yeah. that come out because whoever's going loudest it's, i mean that would be a creative a vocal creative project to create like a zoom <laughs> squeaky chorus um yeah. but again i my my technology is a bit rubbish i mean there's live stream and stuff that you you can you can use to, to edit stuff together so i'd worry about that in terms of anything collective i must admit but i think um from my point of view i think students will work away and if they're encouraged to use space and they're told they can work the three of them together or four of them or in a group i'm sure they will find a way and i'm sure other people here have got experience of that so i'll, I'll, I'll shut up i uh, one one of the question that was raised uh, at uh, i think philippe or maybe edwards edwards session was uh, how do we create like a fun fearless playful safe space for them to kind of make exchanges at yeah. some point and there was there was this whole thinking about it and i don't know we are all still figuring out but if anybody has done that then it would be really nice to kind of unpick on how did you do that where they really had fun and that fun might not be due to the technology what it supports but it's in the design of the work that we do perhaps that so i mean i'm just throwing that out there and i also see on the side uh, jeremy you had something to say you wanted to share something? kind of got yeah. a little bit it was it was sort of reflecting on okay. judith and shan talking about proprioception and ways of mm -hmm. uh, facilitating a new student's awareness and this was just one idea um if you're using kind of how do i say it your sense of say an exercise like imagine the length of your spine you know and you might get a student to to, to find it there that's kind of my spine and then actually mm. the spine begins at the tailbone and then mm. ends at the occiput and actually finding mm. that against the wall and putting marks so mm. that you're kind of you're you're bringing to their awareness both in what what is an absolute length the real length of your spine and your perceived length so mm. even if even if you're not going to get the complete sense of awareness you might get in mm. in a class you're you're beginning to open their awareness that we have a body map that might that might be the same as or might not be the same as our actual body you know so think right. things like that mm -hmm. yeah. That was an idea. That's really great. Thank you. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's all about keying into the senses as well, isn't it? So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Jehan, do you want to say something? Um, I want to go back to Ira's question in a bit, but just on this, one of the things that we've... Uh, so, we've just started these uh, workshops that are just uh, six-session workshops for the general theatre community. And one of the things we soon discovered was it was really important to keep the workshop room open half an hour beforehand and keep the workshop room open half an hour afterhand so that we lost that leave meeting feeling 
and this is such a truncated each one of these lines is so fixed and linear but to create that soft space before and after and we're going to actually put that in as a design feature on every zoom class that we have in the next semester that's one sharing yeah. a question i had was there are certain things that if you were in the space working with a student length of spine or feeling uh, feeling them out you know being able to hold their diaphragm and see how they you know you know something right but now you don't have access to that so as an instructor that becomes invisible to you but through the imagery and visualization that you spoke of in order to create a shared language is there a possibility where you don't know if all of the pieces of the puzzle that they need to get working at the same time line up but somewhere when they finally hit the m that is heard or the they 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 make the sound that sounds like it is resonant or somewhere in their self reporting or somewhere in what you hear across yep. this mediated environment where the outcome of that exercise or that moment tells you that everything that you can't touch and feel and see and guide anymore through side coaching has been reached is there is there something in that I, yeah absolutely i think so i mean with the without banging on about it but without the uh, if you put aside the frustrations of actually can you really hear <laughs> the sound that's being made you can actually i mean working with students on text for example and giving them exercises to release them or find different ways to explore the text i i could i could tell enough from that to be able to do that so i think yes indeed we we would be able to distinguish between a sound that sounded free and and if you like safe um fr from a sound that was that was that was tense um and work with them in that way yeah and then looping back to hetel's question i mean to ira's question on collaborative creation i mean the examples you gave i mean so in all of this i feel like we as faculty step back and we go away from that role of being the person who allows for pedagogy to you know that we don't want to leave them in a room with a chainsaw <laughs> right uh, i love that it was a really good analogy it's something that kali uh, kali and uh, you know kali has really said we've got to be very sure footed about our responsibility in these spaces and it's a very i think that idea that it's very convenient to talk about self learning and self report like all of that you know and just sort of divorce ourselves from our responsibilities and i think that that works and i think that i i'm completely on board with that but in the space of creative collaboration where we say we don't understand even what they're doing but they're so clever they're coming up with so 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 many different things in those spaces what is our role and what is our where does our role end because it clearly doesn't go as far as us being the teachers in the room yeah i think it's a great combo isn't it really if you're saying about skills training uh, that requires uh, in my opinion that people are trained you know they know what they're doing um it i think that's very different from it's not to say that that is uncreative it's creative in, in in its own right it's just a different thing it's a it's a practical skill that we're teaching with the vocal and physical work at one level particularly in the pure voice and pure movement type you know practical stuff um but but like you say with if you're um, encouraging students to give them a brief and off they go then that's a great way of i think the teacher being able to 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 step away from pedagogy as you say um i think that's really really interesting and then and then trying to work out what one's what one's creative role is is fascinating i think you know are you curating are you feeding back are you suggesting it, that would be um something to broker wouldn't mm. it be in the work i think it would be really interesting yeah a lot of the lambda stuff that we've seen through the scratch notes and stuff is self created and a lot of the briefs anyway within the work for some of their projects is 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 towards self creation um and so the curation element is quite small from from the staff but those projects often happen a little bit uh, along the line when they when they've got the experience and they've worked out how to work with each other as well um uh, i um, nikita you can unmute yourself i think she's been raising her hand since a while i hope it doesn't yeah. hurt <laughs> i actually just wanted to respond to what uh, ira brought up um there's there's some experimentation that i've been doing so i take i actually take theater classes remotely for students in kashmir right now and these are students in uh, in their 10th and 12th grades um and something that we tried out was for collaborative work um was firstly in local areas uh, finding a buddy and then 
maintaining social distance and everything, just having pairing people up and then um, creating scenes that way. So that that's one way that we've been able to move forward. And also something interesting that we did was we created a traveling journal. Um, so a journal that has prompts, we put in um, incomplete doodles or incomplete uh, storylines and incomplete thoughts. And this, this journal traveled in one locality, let's say five houses, and it keeps going in circles. So uh, in just in terms of writing skills, um, story building, this is something that has helped us because one student writes something and the next person builds on it. Um, and and they, it's in it's multidisciplinary in the sense that they're sketching and they are uh, putting their own photographs and finding different ways to actually add and create uh, stories. And a third method, finding resources in the house. So, talking mm -hmm. to your grandmother and just creating a performance from that from from the story that she's telling you and how. And as you said that students are brilliant and they take up to technology so much better than I think I do because uh, just within house space they uh, find material that can help them tell the story and it could be just a conversation with the grandmother or a recipe they're learning from the mother but they they've managed to create performances out of that um, and another uh, resource that has really helped us is uh, FIFA and uh, um, arts aaa so art uh, asia art archives they have they've they've opened um, put up an open resource on their website which also has a lot of um, digital collaborative modules put up um, and we we do borrow heavily from them so that was just something i wanted to respond to for Ida. thanks Thank you, Nikita. I, I see Funni had something to say, but then I would uh, also like to invite uh, Tom, maybe. He has some amazing ideas uh, on, he's been working online since a while, and maybe he can share his experiences uh, if he can unmute himself after Funni, if that's all right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, lovely. Yeah. I, I don't, to be honest, if I can be much help, because um, I've done a lot of those things. I've been working with the University of in Finland since 2016 using a system called immersive telepresence in theater which uses um, large-scale rear projection and kind of quite advanced video conference and technology I actually think lambda do something similar similar with the virtual conservatoire guys yeah. as well I don't know. Yeah. Um, but like yourselves like I'm, I'm sitting in my living room and, and zoom is we, we've used zoom uh, and Adobe Connect and things like Blue Jeans uh, for a few years as kind of one-on-one -on -one things with students to kind of augment their experiences in the main room, which is a big space. Um, and I mean, for us, it was always the, when we set up the thing, the, the problem was that um, these technologies are very limited. You're like, I, I'm a tiny little person. Most of you are probably looking at me on a laptop and I'm less than an inch high. Uh, and so we wanted to explore some stuff together. So we, we went big. We went into you know, full-sized rear projection with actors standing life-size because we wanted to see feet and faces and we wanted high quality sound. And we wanted to give the actors the impression that they were actually sharing the space so that the other country was the another side of the room. And of course we ran into, I mean, we weren't technologists, we were, theater practitioners quite like technologies and over the years we've become technologists because uh, we had to be because we ran into all kinds of problems in the first year like echo cancellation we didn't know what that was we didn't know that your sound travels to another location and because there's a delay you come out of the other speakers and you hear your own voice back um but like everyone else i mean i'm kind of experiencing this weird uh, Zoom fatigue and the limitations of this as a format and just little things like not being able to arrange the windows into an order that everyone can own. So I mean, I, you know, at the minute I'm at the top of the screen, but I'll bet on somebody else's screen I'm at the bottom of the screen or I'm somewhere else. So I can't even pass an object from one place to another. <laughs> and, you know, so we run into those things. But I will say there are some very helpful networks out there I put in the link. There's network performing arts. <laughs> Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> the joy of Zoom stuff. Yeah, we had to have that. Yeah, 
so the, the network performing arts production workshop, which is mainly, I mean, when we started it, we discovered that people in music have been doing this for years, like way back from the 90s over telephone. Um, they've been doing instrumental tuition. So there's actually a lot of research out there and there's some really interesting kit. Lambda have, I think, Lola. Yeah. Uh, low latency audio kit. There's stuff like ultra grid. There's the problem is yeah. that you need. It's a bit like I try and explain it to other members of staff. It's a bit like living in a world where your iPhone can only phone another iPhone and it can't phone a Samsung because all of these are proprietary and they only work with yeah. the other side. But there is actually some really interesting work out there for the future if we can ever get out of this bloody pandemic. Uh, I think online <coughs> collaboration is an amazing way of working internationally. Uh, and it's actually a more environmentally friendly way of working internationally. Um, on a scale like we're doing it, it really isn't very, it really isn't very different from normal practice. There's a little bit of latency, but it's not much different. But I think we're all in the same boat now with this horrible Zoom limitations, unfortunately. I think with with the with the low with the virtual conservatoire, which you're very right in in, in reminding me about, Tom. <laughs> I'm going to share a secret now. I was really, really bullshy, frankly, about not wanting to be driven down the route of a lot of virtual learning. And what an idiot was I, as it turns out. But you know, we were encouraged. We did this extraordinary physical Greek and vocal Greek project, and and they wanted to do that virtually. And we're going well. The whole point of this is to wake up senses. So why would you then do this? You know. So so there was a lot lot of that at the time from me. And of of course, like you say, those technologies are they're kind of site specific in themselves at the moment. We can't use them. Yeah in this way for the teaching. But I think there is, you know, I think what it has done for me is made me realize very rapidly that I need to, I need to, um, to, to get on board with that stuff a bit more. I still don't think it will ever replace a living, breathing human being, but I think I, it's, it can be really exciting about what you can achieve with those technologies. I actually really hope it doesn't. I've been very controversial to your work all the time. I, <laughs> I, I, I resist uh, because I mean, I regard myself as a director and I yeah. get as much joy out of you know being in a physical space with my performers making a piece of work the other thing is like a different flavor i think if everything becomes it's like having a buffet with only samosas in it like somebody doesn't like <laughs> samosas it's a very boring buffet and i think that that's the problem is zoom is a great flattener of experience it it, it um everything looks like zoom eventually and i think you know those limitations of virtual backgrounds and passing the object you exhaust those really really quickly yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I, I, I have personally reached a spot where I am thinking to myself that can I thrive in this work that I'm doing as a voice person without my computer? Is there a way to do that? And I really want to do it without my technology at all, even when it's supporting. But that's a thought. On because it's extremely exhausting to, like I was just talking to Judith, how dramatic an action it is that every time I finish even a 30 minute Zoom session, even if it is, once the session is done, it's almost dramatic where I will shut my lid with a bang and I will leave my space. <laughs> even if it's for a few seconds, it's as dramatic as it sounds right now. But I mean, I don't know if there is a way to continue working right now in this situation without our laptops. But well, that's just a sharing. Um, I do see Daniel has something to share. Um, yeah. Funmi has been waiting yeah. since a while. And I want to unpick on one more thing, uh, which is how are, what are our tiny steps that we may take? And I'm opening this to the room, actually. What are our tiny little steps that we will take, perhaps, or think about taking when we start teaching our new students who we don't know right now? What is it that we're really going to focus on? You know, to get things right, we may fail, but what are our first steps? But I'll first hand it over to Funmi and then maybe Daniel, and then maybe the room can talk about what I just said. Okay. Funmi. Thank you. Um, am I? <laughs> Thank you. I, I was, um, I just put some ideas in the chat, actually. It was about um, how we've been making productions um, group productions online. I haven't been a maker, but I've, some of my colleagues have. And um, what I've observed that I found interesting, one of my colleagues made a piece with 18 students 
who are all in isolation. And so she conceived of the piece as a house and each, each one, each student was in a particular room in the house. And she created a piece, a site specific. So in her direction, they had to find particular locations in their house. And it was a choreographic choreographed piece. So they were working with, you know, the environment. So that's how she was able to bring in um, variety. So there was a sort of kind of common theme, but the student had to then work and then she would direct them in to be more imaginative with the space and where they place the camera. She said it was extremely exhausting because it was more or less, less working with 18 solos and duets. And then there's the editing of it together. So it, in the end, um, it was edited. Another one that works uh, very well and I think has become quite common on Facebook is um, somebody will come up with a score and everybody will learn that score. And, and get someone to film them at their different locations. And then when it's edited together, uh, the editor decides where in the score he um, will, will start editing it. So, so not each solo starts at the same place. Um, it, I've seen some that are really uh, quite exciting using costumes. So you see this color red going across all the solos. Um, but then I sometimes think the editor is the director uh, of the piece or brings another layer of direction to the piece, um, depending on how he sees a narrative forming. Then recently, uh, some colleagues of mine in Nigeria, they took part in a piece called The Art of Failing Fear, um, or Facing Fear, and it is about the COVID pandemic. And it was quite interesting how it was. It was an international collaboration, some people, I think it was started off with colleagues in Brazil who brought in people from South Africa, Nigeria, Spain, UK. So I think about eight countries or 10 countries. So I, I'm just going to tell my experience as an audience member. So when we're let into the chat room, there was somebody on screen who says, how are you experiencing the pan pandemic? What, what, what feelings of fear are you having? So we put, that, put those things in the chat. Then they also asked us, um, do we know anyone who passed away during the pandemic? And well, how do you remember them? So it was quite an emotional, people were putting those things, remembering people in the chat. Then when it started, um, the piece was sort of, I would describe it as, um, I don't know whether it was, it must have been live. They must have been using the Zoom live because what we said in the chat appeared in their dialogue. And, and in the piece. So they used um, what we put in the chat as their script. So I don't know if someone was directing the Zoom, but it was a, uh, but they had, I would say they used the gallery. They told us to put our phones and laptops to gallery view. And there were some instructions on how to use, whether you're using um, a laptop or whether you're using your phone. So they told us to start from gallery view and then you had um, like 18 boxes of, you know, performers, and they were talking using a sort of chorus thing. So uh, some of that, as they were um, like poetry and um, lines drawing on the chat and obviously mixed up with things that they've um, prepared beforehand. And then they will go to split screen and then you had someone dancing on one side of the screen and somebody um, talking, giving a monologue on another side of the screen. So the, that, that was working in tandem, then it would go back mm. to gallery view and then we have a chorus of voices exploring the theme and then it would go to speaker view and there's one person acting a whole sort of monologue, playing a character, then it goes back to gallery view. So it was very inventive how they use the different, um, the different way that Zoom is set up to, to uh, make the piece. And then at the end of the piece, um, they invited us to stay online and talk to the performers and we could ask questions about the rehearsal process and how they got together and things like that. So I found it, I mean, it was weird, but also wonderful. I enjoyed it. And um, I've put a link to a review um, on in the chat. Um, they are performing it every Friday and Saturday for the whole of August. So there might be 
a few more performances left if you're interested in catching up with it. So that was something I really uh, learned something from. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is about using a, a colleague of mine, I've been discussing with a colleague of, of, about how do you do theatre in, in these kind of circumstances. And we were talking about the house becoming a hub. We we're laughing that we're all becoming broadcasters now, you know, you have to start having a, pe a part of the house where, where, you, where you can get the light to be seen and gradually buying bits and pieces of equipment. But also um, what's, what's emerging is two things to me of people co-op, of, of this idea of domestic, domestic theatre developing and um, students co-opting brothers and sisters to try out acting exercises that they, <laughs> that they can't do. So, you know, when Judith was talking about this proximity exercise where you start holding hands and moving further away, someone will co-op their brother and, you know, uh, and practice it, then come back with their reflection on, on, yeah. on that activity. Mm -hmm. So some of the things, because, you know, we teach contact improv. I'm like, how do you teach contact improvisation? You know, now, you know, do it, we do it on the wall. Someone said, forget it, it, it belonged to the last century, but it doesn't exist. Or do, or do we start learning to do with the object? So, I mean, we're sort of thinking, but co-opting family members and this sort of domestic theatre emerging where people are practicing on their family and then reflecting um, back to us is sort of, away obviously you don't want to cause accidents at home but <laughs> um we found that that has sort of helped for some of the things that involve contact which we can no longer do you know sort of in a face-to-face -face setting super okay um very quickly a time check uh, we will be not ending the meeting but ending the meeting at uh, 15 past five and thankfully, I am not going to end the meeting. Shruti is going to do the dishonor of ending a meeting. But uh, I am just going to open this up a little bit if anybody wants to talk, share anything very quickly. Otherwise, I really want to hear about very, very quickly. If everybody can just really unmute themselves and one by one, if you can share, what is that one thing you're going to focus on when you meet your new student? Or Because we are going to meet a new student and I'm quite curious in knowing what should we kind of think about maybe you've already done that maybe you will be doing that so it would be really nice to have all the glowing boxes one by one to very quickly just throwing in one idea and go for it so i'm going to start and just ever we can just kind of wait and continue i will name and we can do it so jeremy i will ask them what they're interested in perhaps that day perhaps long term. okay Sean? Um, I'm going to focus on storytelling, I think, and start with the self and ask them to share things that they're able to share about themselves. Because I think it's key. I think, I think for me, what's been revealing about this is that the idea of storytelling, I think, is going to be really key for beginners um, and working either with the domestic or just working with family stories or their own stories and creating lists about themselves and then finding ways of performing that in some yeah. ways. Judith. <laughs> I think vocally, probably similar to Jeremy, it would be about finding that initial little door to start trust. How, how do we develop a trusting relationship? Yeah. Trust. Aiden. Oh. Um, Sorry, I do not no, I very don't need to put cautious, you on spot. Slow, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the slow, gentle, first baby steps toward a journey of unfolding uh, and discovering what it is that students need to express and learn and how they feel or we feel together we can go on that journey within the context that we're working I think. so yeah very very ben, I actually have no idea I'm kind of listening to what everybody's saying I will have a cohort of about 20 American students. Um, hopefully some of them will be in the space. I would very much like to meet them in the space first and then talk Fabulous. to them. Fabulous. Lovely. Ida. Uh, yeah, I think my concern is, is, is that they're going to be new and that they have 
no understanding of the theater that we that we keep talking about uh, so i think my i would start slow and i'd help them sort of look inside to understand the outside and what's going on outside yeah. lovely kali daniel and nikita in that order kali so i'm a i'm a purist and i fight a lot uh and for me it's all about remembering that there is no theater bus that we are missing if we don't create stuff that is going to be filmed and put up put up online so i'd rather work towards uh, building the giving the students the absolute ne- absolutely necessary tools for them for when they do come into the space i mm-hmm. do struggle a lot with the idea of on collaborating creating work together uh, further than writing and i am not very keen in solving that problem actually i don't want to okay. solve it that's fine that's fine daniel okay i'm i'm really sorry not putting anybody on spot you can choose not to speak if you don't want to and just want to listen but let's try and make it like very rapid fiery and quick quick thing rather than a thought if we can it's just fun that's why daniel um i'm about to actually start so there's there's been a bit of a saga i was going to direct a show with real students in a real room it got cancelled it's back on so one of the things that will be exciting is if Well one of the things we're exploring is starting with masks on that's going to be totally weird uh so that'll be exciting but I always start with games it's always games and it will always be games and I'll work it out lovely it. but it will be through games lovely nikita actually i i got the idea through this session but whenever i do meet my students the first exercise i want them to do is the distance like from far away just slowly over maybe a period of an hour just keep coming closer and closer and that that's how i want them to meet and start fabulous elizabeth catherine michael in the <laughs> order jehan i've skipped you sorry huh. no it's okay <laughs> uh well i i will try to establish real communication among them and use the zoom um Ah! <laughs> I use the Zoom um, capacity to really transmit subtle information and experience. Thank you. Catherine. Hi, Catherine here. Um, I'm going to start, uh, well, first of all, entering the space in vocal history and profile so that they're actually telling the story, their vocal story, and then put them in breakout rooms to share with each other so um so that they will be coming you know talking from their own experience that's, that's my plan for the first exercise thank you mm-hmm. michael uh hello um i completely agree with uh, storytelling uh and games uh but i think as well uh embracing the failures of zoom and oh. of our technology uh and and through that find a fun and amusing platform um and i intend to sort of rein- reinvent uh not reinvent but repurpose a lot of keith johnson's work uh in improv for storytellers um and about being average uh and that being okay within this completely daunting dynamic Mhm 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 um uh, sorry no, I yeah to say okay something. okay mm-hmm. jehan so because jehan is taking it uh, without me giving it to him i am sorry but i'm not go going to go on with this rapid fire we could mm-hmm. perhaps but i was really enjoying this bit but uh, we'll see if we have some more time if shruti allows we'll do it otherwise i'm sorry yes jehan I was going to just say I'm going to really start by trying to see if I can breathe together with them even though we're in different spaces and places. Um and really just try and build everything from that moment in time and keep coming back to that as a baseline uh experience. Uh and just coming back to Kali's thing about the theater bus because we are having this very public debate with each other. Um but it is about uh I don't want to lose 
the fact that they are not necessarily learning theater whilst they are in this space learning through us and our past experiences of theater. So we have to find a way to remind them of what they aren't doing in this space whilst being very positive and proactive about what they are doing in this space. Um, on that, and this is me trying to have the last word also, not really. I just wanted to say, uh, I've got to say this, uh, Judith, Hethel, thank you so much for, for really taking us through an hour and opening up the conversations. It's been really delightful to see new faces here and uh, returning faces. Um, I, these sessions are every Thursday. We're going to try and move them to 5 p.m. a little bit later in India time so that some of the Eastern Seaboard people don't have to wake up at 6 a.m. to watch this stuff. Um, and Elizabeth, much impressiveness that you are showing up first thing in the morning to see this. Uh, I can't even wake up at the time you're awake, but really impressive. Elizabeth's in from Jamaica, by the way. This is the second time I've seen her and I've really loved her, her input. Um, Unrehearsed Futures continues. Um, the DSM blog, Shruti is posting it, but you will get, uh, so for example, Sita did a talk, Falguni, who's somewhere in the back rows, somewhere quietly, uh, writes a lovely piece of reportage around different talks um, and puts them up. But if you want to listen, because there's nothing like listening to Amy Russell or Felipe talking about what they're saying, um, you can do it while chopping vegetables. Just talk to Shruti Aurora on Info at Drama School Mumbai, and she will, um, uh, she will send you the, uh, the link to the MP4 files because we're not putting them up on YouTube or anything right now uh, until we figured out how we're going to do that with everybody's permission. Um, so that's where we are. And um, next week we're taking a break. We've done six of these and we're good for now. We have to get into war footing and create our course and get that all announced by the 31st of August for a very hard and a furious September enrollment for October start. Um, but then um, we come back on the week after that, uh, which is the 3rd of September. And it's going to be uh, Amy Russell uh, talking to, so it's going to be Giovanni Pusetti uh, from Helicos uh, in conversation with Amy Russell, who also spoke here. Um, and they really are going to speak about, I think, uh, you know, this thing that we are doing right now is not theater. Um, but in that process, I think by identifying and articulating what this is not, to then confidently go in and investigate what this is without losing the idea of the thing that we must come back to in real space and time. Because I think it addresses both the embrace the new, but don't forget the old. And I think that's going to be a really great uh, conversation to be had. Um, the 10th. I'm trying to, I haven't confirmed the 10th, but I'm hoping for Janice Spoon from Hong Kong Academy of Performing Arts um, because they are living through two kinds of disruption, the China-Hong Kong disruption uh, yeah. and the disruption of COVID. Um, then on the 17th, it's going to be Sarah Machet who's just taken over as head of school. And that's really funny. I've talked to three people who just inherited the title of head of school uh, <laughs> and then got hit by COVID. And so I want them all to meet with each other. Uh, and uh, that's going to be the 17th. And then the 24th, uh, Aiden is uh, taking a conversation with Nicole Stinson from WAPA in Australia. Mm. Um, and we're very excited for that conversation as well. So these conversations will go through. And then I've just been talking to Amy, who is polite, who's kindly decided to carry the curatorial torch forward uh, into uh, October, October, November. So these conversations will continue. We will loop back to things in terms of how we are all progressing with our new batches, et cetera. Um, and uh, hopefully the whole thing together will become a real compendium of shared knowledge that we can keep coming back to. But more than that, if we all end up starting something together because we've been coming to these conversations, nothing like it. Um, so with that, thank you. I have to leave because I've got to attend to my son, but the room is open and much love. And Judith, Hethel, thank you so much for everything. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Please talk to Shruti. She's there. Shruti, wave and identify yourself and get on mic so that everyone can see you because uh, I can't spotlight you. And Hi, everyone. Um, and she, will, she really is holding the space together and making sure that everybody has access to each other. And if you've met somebody here that you want to communicate with ahead, uh, just send an email to that person via Shruti and she will forward it on and then you guys can be married together. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh
uh, the important links that uh, people have shared in this uh, conversation in the chat box i will upload them along with the recording of the video so if you need the recording of the video please drop an email to info@dramaschoolmumbai.in and uh, we also have the recordings of the previous conversation you can have access to them thank you jude pleasure thank you thank you thank, thank, thank you everybody thank you thank you Shruti, is there a copy of that email address, of your email address in the chat? Or the, the you want me to... Sorry? Is there a copy of the correct email address that you said if we want to contact people we've met? Yes, yes. And, and yes. we have to do it through you. Is, is there a copy of the email address? You want me to... She has the list, uh, I believe. Yes, yes, I she, do, I you do. You just I have do. to drop an email to her and she'll kind of perhaps send a... Yeah, so to drop an email to uh, me if you want to speak to anyone, and I can share the email IDs of those people with you. Okay. We have all the email IDs of people who ended the session today. Great. I'm. I'm not. Go I'm not going to press the leave button. <laughs> okay, okay. I must go. Lovely to see you all. See you. Bye. Bye.